Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anita Nielsen, and I'm the Senior Director for Annual and Planned Giving at Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our spring behind-the-scenes lecture for 2012. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. This is, in fact, the seventh consecutive year that we have been offering these lectures, and we have covered a number of topics, ranging from arthritis to ophthalmology to epilepsy to cardiac disease. And today you are in for a treat because um, we have a very, very dynamic speaker who will be speaking on esophageal cancer. None of this would be possible without your support. And so on behalf of the foundation, I'd like to thank you all once again for being so gener generous and allowing us to do the things that we do here at the hospitals that are transforming lives, not only in your community, but also around the world. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that this afternoon. At today's lecture, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Gail Darling, thoracic surgeon at Toronto General Hospital and holder of the Crest Family Chair in Esophageal Cancer. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Ed Kress, who is here in the audience somewhere. Thank you very much, Mr. Kress, for coming. I'd also like to welcome one of Dr. Darling's patients, Mr. Edgar Provis. Mr. Provis is featured on the cover of our most recent Report on Your Support newsletter. He joins us all the way from Trenton. And um, I hope you've had an opportunity to read his story and report on your support. Um, it's, very, it's a very um, powerful story, and we're so pleased to have Mr. Provis with us today. Also featured on the cover, we have Dr. Tom Waddell. And many of you may have seen Dr. Waddell in the news this week, in fact. He was the lead surgeon on the double lung transplant of Alain Campbell. Who, um, whose personal campaign to increase organ donation has taken the country by storm and increased the number of people signing up for organ donation. So at this point, I would like to call upon Dr. Waddell to come and make a few introductory remarks and introduce Dr. Darling. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I would like to... Uh Thank Anita for that introduction, and uh, I want to say uh, very much how interested I am to be here today. The, I'm not only a member of UHM, but I'm a sometime donor to the uh, uh, foundations, both uh, here and at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital, and I really uh, love to get the uh, mailings from the foundation and to see the interest in the public for what goes on in a hospital. And I, I think that you should all be congratulated for taking time out of your schedules to come and learn more about the activities that your uh, contributions uh, help to support. And I, I really applaud your interest as well as your philanthropy. So it's my pleasure to um, welcome uh, all of you to hear Dr. Darling speak. Dr. Darling holds the Crest uh, Family Chair in Esophageal Cancer and is director of our clinical research program in the Division of Thoracic Surgery. She's uh, a professor of thoracic surgery at the University of Toronto and has been for some many years now. Uh, and uh, for also for many years, she's been the director of the esophageal function laboratory. Gail received her medical degree from the University of Western Ontario. She did her uh, training uh, in thoracic surgery at the Mayo Clinic, which is a very significant institution in that field, and she's, of course, uh, a certified thoracic surgeon at the Royal College of uh, Surgeons of Canada. And Gail did uh, extra training in research at the National Cancer Institute and came back to Toronto and first uh, set up her practice initially at the Wellesley Hospital and then moved to Mount Sinai Hospital, where we first met, and I uh, thank her for her contribution to my education. So Gail leads, without a doubt, the largest comprehensive esophageal program in Canada, covering both esophageal cancer and benign conditions of the esophagus. And uh, most recently, we've really added uh, a basic research component as well, and we're continuing to build that program through the support of Ed and Patty Cress, and uh, I'm sure that will be a big part of Gail's lecture today. Uh, 
So I think, you know, for those of you who have met Gail personally, and I suspect there may be more than just uh, the two identified uh, by Anita, you'll all uh, recognize that Gail is somebody who is really passionately committed to the care of her patients, and she has a uh, personal warmth and a personal relationship with her patients. We can kind of judge that at the Christmas season because every day Gail is going home with large packages under her arm and, and I always kind of think to myself, I still haven't learned everything I have to learn from Gail Darling about uh, caring for patients. So um, with that in mind, I'll, I'll uh, pass it back to uh, Paul Farrell, I believe, is going to be uh, introducing Gail. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Tom, I'm delighted to hear that you're a donor, so I'll catch up with you afterwards. And my, my other takeaway was that, Gail, we're going to have to monetize all those Christmas gifts you, gifts you get, and we'll try to get you to the next level. Um, Tom, thanks for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome uh, each of you here today on behalf of the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation, where I serve as a board member. It's my privilege as board champion for esophageal cancer program to tell you about uh, how Gail and her team are improving the lives of our patients and to explain how you can make a difference. If you don't already know this, UHN is one of the top five cancer research, research hospitals in the world, something we can all be very proud of that we have that right in our doorsteps. Let me highlight some of the exciting work in esophageal cancer that Gail's been up to with her team. Gail and her colleagues have made incredible strides in how we diagnose and treat this particular cancer and other disorders of the esophagus. This afternoon, you will hear about their innovations, which are making a difference in the lives of patients. The team performs over 450 surgical procedures every year. Many of these cases transferred from other hospitals, talked about that earlier, due to their level of complexity, which is great. They're developing cutting edge imaging technologies to enhance early diagnosis, which in turn improves the likelihood of recovery for patients. I am proud to say that our esophageal cancer program provides the most effective clinical care and has the best patient care in Canada. And that's not all. Gail and her team are surgeons, clinicians, researchers, and just as important, educators. The role of an educator is vital in sharing their experience, expertise, and knowledge with the next generation of medical leaders in Canada and the world. Thank you for your past and continue, pardon me, continued support for our hospitals. The work of our surgeons and scientists speaks for itself in the quality of life that patients enjoy after enduring experience with cancer and other illnesses. We could not do it without you, our donors. On behalf of the University Health Network, the staff, the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation, I'd like to convey our profound gratitude for your continued support. Please feel free to contact me, call me, email me, tackle me after this presentation uh, if we can help with any of the uh, questions for today and to continue the support of, of Gail Darling. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Gail to come forward and present this exclusive behind the scenes lecture and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. I'm not good with technology, what can I say? Because I'm old, right, Tom? I went to a, um, a Canadian thoracic surgery meeting a couple of years ago, and I looked around the room and I thought, oh my goodness, I've trained three quarters of these surgeons. Uh, so it's, uh, I have a little bit of a history. I would uh, like to echo the comments that have already been made. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. Um, it's a great honor to be able to speak to you today about our program. Uh, and again, I want to also acknowledge uh, Ed and Patty Cress and Brookfield Partners for their generous donation that really got this all started and make, continues to make it possible. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead. All our programs really start with a patient problem, and uh, I'm first and foremost a clinical surgeon. And the patient's problem is that they have trouble swallowing. And if it first starts with the odd time they go to a restaurant, you know, the steak doesn't go down so easily. 
And then it progresses to the point where they're having trouble even with soft foods, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese. And then they're starting to choke on liquids. Some patients may have pain with, when they swallow, but largely it's just that feeling that food isn't going down easily. And early on, most patients kind of think, oh, well, you know, I was hurrying, it was this, it was that, I didn't chew my food. Uh, and it's so easy to kind of ignore that first symptom. Uh, so many of our patients don't come to our attention and don't seek us out until that cancer has been growing for a while. And by then, they've often lost a fair bit of weight. So this is our, how we start with our problem. And this slide is just to show you what esophagus cancer looks like on a barium swallow. So a barium swallow is an x-ray test. It's an old-fashioned x-ray test, but it's very useful. And so the patient swallows this white stuff that shows up on the x-ray. And you can probably appreciate this, this is uh, kind of irregular and ratty looking. This is what the normal esophagus looks like down here. This is the cancer in this area. And this is the uh, dilated or stretched out esophagus that's been obstructed. And this is what it looks like when we look down with the endoscope. So you can see this sort of you know, ugly fungating uh, tumor that's blocking the esophagus. And this is the normal esophagus lining here. So one of our problems um, with esophagus cancer is the anatomy. Now I hate to be critical of our maker, but um, the lymphatic channels in the esophagus run just below the very inner lining layer of the esophagus. And so it's very easy to, for the cancer to spread into the lymph channels. So here, it, these are all early cancers. This is uh, what we call a high-grade dysplasia where the cancer hasn't even started to invade. And these other cancers, these little lumps here, are tumors that have just started to invade. These are cancers that are almost never symptomatic. They're detected incidentally when you have a scope for some other reason. And even at that very early stage, they can get into the lymphatic channels. And once they're in the lymphatic channels, the cancer cells can spread throughout the body. So that's our challenge. And because of that problem, um, a lot of patients with esophagus cancer are not cured by surgery alone, and we need more help. And this slide just illustrates um, what happens over time. So if you have the very earliest cancer, you have a very good chance of being cured. But most of our patients are in these lower curves, and so surgery alone isn't good enough for them. So what's happened with esophagus cancer? This slide shows you what the, has happened in terms of the frequency of esophagus cancer. And the, you can see that the um, curve for esophagus is way up here at the top, and it's just been steadily increasing since 1975, whereas down here is colorectal and lung cancer and breast cancer. The frequency of those cancers is remaining relatively stable. So we have this huge problem, and it seems to be affecting white males more than others uh, in particular, and we don't entirely understand why that is. So we've, we're doing some research into that, and I'll, I'll come back to that. We know that some of the risk factors for adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma is, used to be a rare cancer in the esophagus, but it is now the predominant type. Um, the other common type is squamous cell cancer, and squamous cancer has been fairly constant. It hasn't changed in frequency. But adenocarcinoma has really skyrocketed. And we know the factors that contributed, contribute to this are being overweight, uh, heartburn troubles, gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, something called Barrett's esophagus, which I'll talk about a little more later. And there's always been an interest in, is it something to do with our diet? And I think this has not been really nailed down, but it looks like all those things that we like to eat aren't good for us. So diets that are high in red meat, what we call a high glycemic index, so high refined carbohydrates, high fat and low fiber, uh, seem to contribute to the development of esophageal cancer. Smoking is also a risk factor for this type of cancer, for adenocarcinoma. Smoking and, and alcohol intake are a risk factor for squamous cancer, but Drinking does not seem to be a factor in adenocarcinoma. And if you have a family history of cancer, you may be more at risk as well. I already sort of alluded to this. This is the problem with surgery alone, that if you have very early cancer, you can be cured by surgery. And that's the top part of these curves up here. 
but most of our patients are down here. And this is an old slide, so we're, I think we're doing better than that. But again, it just speaks to the fact that we need more than surgery to help our patients. So our esophageal program at UHN has three pillars. Uh, clinical care first and foremost. We want to take better care of our patients, offer them the best care possible. We want to uh, uh, look at new treatments with research, and we want to educate both patients and doctors and future surgeons. So first of all, we want to look at how can we improve our outcomes. And so here are some of our strategies. We first want to improve just the results of our operations, how as we uh, as surgeons do better. Um, have fewer complications. Uh, we want to do some clinical trials because that helps us to evaluate new treatments. We want to increase awareness. Like I said, so many people ignore that first symptom. Uh, so we want both doctors and patients, the public, to be aware of what the first symptoms are. We would strive to identify who's at risk. We all have some heartburn from time to time. Does that mean I'm going to get esophagus cancer? I hope not. But if I'm at risk, can I identify that risk earlier on uh, before I really can't swallow my, my, uh, my uh, steak? We'd like to be able to identify genetic markers that predict risk. Can we get a blood test? Can we do something that uh, identifies you as being a person at risk? Then we'd like to be able to modify and reduce that risk. And we'd like to identify also molecular markers or things in our cells that predict uh, whether someone is going to be sensitive to the treatments we're recommending or whether they're going to not respond very well to those treatments. And then finally, we'd like to identify molecular targets for, for therapy, so what we call personalized medicine. So instead of treating everybody with the same drug, we can pick out the particular drug that that patient and that patient's tumor is going to respond to. So those are kind of lofty goals. And uh, we're, we're, sorry, we are, uh, sorry working on those. Uh, technology. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Sorry, I did it. I did it. It's okay. So, so what have we done so far? So uh, we have started, we started at the very basics. We looked at evaluating our treatment outcomes. We established a uh, surgical database uh, which now has over 400 patients, and we actually just looked at how we were doing with, what, with the surgery we were doing. We uh, collaborated with our colleagues in medical and radiation oncology, as well as pathology and diagnostic radiology, to develop multidisciplinary teams to help deliver better cancer care. Uh, we've started some clinical trials to evaluate different treatment options, and we've done trials both in-house, just here at UHN, as well as participated in what are called cooperative group trials, and we'll talk some more about that. We've uh, established a tumor bank, and we've started, as Tom mentioned, a translational research program. So with respect to our surgical database, we have over 400 patients in our database. We know kind of who they are, how old are they, uh, what, are they male or female. We know details about their operation. We know details about how they've done from their operation. Did they have any complications? We know about their tumors, what we call TNM, T for tumor, N for nodes, M for metastases. So we know about their pathologic data. We know whether they've survived from their surgery or not, whether their cancers recurred. We've also been looking at their quality of life, and we have uh, quality of life reports on most of those patients. And we are able to link uh, with an epidemiologic database uh, that has been run by Dr. Jeffrey Liu, and I'll come to that later on. And I wa want to mention that Catherine Zeman, who has put together this database for us and continues to uh, maintain it. What about clinical trials? Clinical trials are ways for us to evaluate treatments and um, they allow us to offer cutting-edge therapies to patients that aren't available just if you go somewhere else uh, because they're not paid for by OHIP uh, and we can, we can offer those new treatments to patients. And so we've completed two in-house trials We've participated in a large North America-wide cooperative group trial, which is ongoing. We are going to be leading the Canadian arm of a new international trial that uh, is being conducted in Canada, in Australia, and New Zealand, and uh, also likely in Europe. The European group has also signed on, and that trial will be open this fall. 
and we're developing new clinical trials. We're participating with the Alliance Cancer Cooperative Group uh, in the U.S. to develop a new uh, trial for esophageal cancer patients. In our tumor bank, we've got over 400 samples, and these include samples of tumors that we've taken out at surgery, as well as tumors we've biopsied. And we've used some of those samples to look at uh, something called microRNA. MicroRNA is a kind of piece of genetic information, uh, and we've about looked at uh, that microRNA prior to treatments, chemotherapy and radiation, and after treatment. And we've got further studies ongoing, and I'll come back to that a bit later. We're also contributing samples from our tumor bank to the NIH Cancer Genome Atlas Project. Uh, we're one of a very few number of centers that have um, samples of, from tumors prior to chemotherapy and radiation and after, so they're particularly inter interested in us participating, and because of our tumor bank, we're able to do so. We're also creating something called a tissue microarray to use for testing genetic changes in tumors, and we're evaluating a new gene that has been uh, identified in uh, squamous cancers, we're going to look at it in, a, in adenocarcinomas. So uh, just a little bit about our clinical trials, and I mentioned these trials are important because they allow us to offer patients cutting-edge therapies or new therapies. When we first started, our first clinical trial was important because it allowed us to develop that collaboration, which is so important. Um, and they, so they established our multidisciplinary collaboration in treating our patients, and they allowed us also to very accurately assess our results, which we really hadn't done before. So that really got us off the ground. Our first trial uh, just used kind of standard chemotherapy drugs in a maybe new combination, and our second trial allowed us to use a new drug, a targeted therapy, uh, which is kind of one of those steps towards personalized medicine. And I just want to show you some examples. This is a CT scan picture from our first patient on our first clinical trial. And there's a little story about this because this patient was referred to us because uh, no one else would offer her any treatment. And we, we thought, okay, you know, we could do this. But my colleagues in medical and radiation oncology got this CT scan. So I saw a CT scan that had been done a month or six weeks earlier and I said, okay, yeah, well, you know, we can probably take that out. Okay, you give her chemotherapy and radiation first. Well, then they went and got this CT scan, which I never saw, and they started her on her treatments. And if I had seen this CT scan, I would have said, no surgery. But this is her CT scan after treatment, and that thing has shrunk dramatically. And when we resected that tumor, there were only three live cancer cells left. So that's a very dramatic response. Not everybody gets quite that dramatic response, but it just shows you what you can do if you try. There's another fellow who was turned down elsewhere. This is a 33-year-old man, married, five-year-old son. He's got uh, extensive lymph node involvement. And these are big lymph nodes here and here. His tumor's down here somewhere. And you can see there's more lymph nodes up here and here. And this is pressing on the vein that drains the blood from his left lung. He's also got lymph nodes down here in his tummy. So he's got lymph nodes kind of from here to here. And the doctors that saw him elsewhere said, that's, that's too big a radiation field. We could give you some chemotherapy, but that's the best we can do. His wife is a good advocate for him, and, and she said, can you do something? And I said, well, we can try. And I have to say, I was a little nervous about it, but um, we did. And he had a fantastic response to his chemo radiation. We resected him in December, and he's doing well so far. It's early days yet. Uh, but most of those lymph nodes were just fibrotic scars when we took them out. Now here's another fellow. This is pictures of a PET scan. I'm not sure how well it projects, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about PET scans. PET scans are a relatively new imaging technique that are based on the metabolic activity of tissues. So tissues that are growing very fast light up as being hot on a PET scan. And uh, we were able to offer PET scans to our patients for a number of years now because we were doing a clinical trial. That got, we could do it through our um, donations from patients and so on and from families. 
Um, the government just approved PET scans for esophagus cancer last fall. So now OHIP will pay for these scans. This fellow had a cancer of his lower esophagus. Now we thought he was going to have a squamous cancer because he was a very heavy drinker, heavy smoker. But he turned out also to have very bad reflux and had an, the usual adenocarcinoma. And his tumor was pretty big and so we were going to offer him chemotherapy and radiation. But then we got his PET scan. And this is his tumor down here. And his PET scan showed activity way up here in his chest, uh, in a, quite a distance from, from uh, the primary tumor. And so we said, oh, that's a, that's a bit different. That's not what we thought we were dealing with. And we proved that those, those lymph nodes were actually involved by cancer by biopsying them with a technique called EBUS, endobronchial ultrasound. So we actually went down the windpipe and to put a needle through the windpipe into those lymph nodes, and we proved that there was cancer there. And I, again, thought, this guy, I don't know about the surgery for this guy. But we went ahead with our chemotherapy and radiation. And again, he had a great response. And we resected him um, in the new year, January. And again, so far, so good. But those lymph nodes that were so hot on that PET scan were all just scar tissue when we took them out. The last patient I want to show you for this part is a 53-year-old gentleman. And this is a bit of a complex slide. These are CT pictures and a PET picture. This is a sideways, this is the usual view of the CT, and this is a sideways view. So we're looking from the side. And you might think, recognize this is the spine back here. This is the aorta, the blood vessel that takes the blood from your heart to your body. And this is the blood vessel called the celiac artery that take, gives branches to the stomach, to the liver, and to the spleen. And, and there's a big thing here that's not supposed to be there, and that's a big lymph node mass. And when we look at it in the usual cross sections, it's this horseshoe-shaped thing here. And again, the PET scan shows that to be hot. And not very long ago, we would have said, no, no, we're not doing that either. Uh, so we also were able to resect him after chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, and also, he had a fantastic response. Um, tumor only shrunk about 50%, but again, most of it was scar tissue. So the other thing we've learned is that even if it doesn't go away, sometimes all that's left, that lump that's still left, is just scar tissue. So we shouldn't say no just on the basis of the x-ray. So that's what we've done in our clinical program. We've also looked at quality of life. So we've been treating these patients in a very aggressive fashion. And some people say, well, you know, is it really worth it? You know, you're putting them through so much. So we actually have been measuring quality of life in patients to see, you know, is it worth it from the other side, from the quality of life side? And so this is just a small group of patients which shows their overall quality of life score when they start, when they come with their cancer. They get their sorry, chemotherapy and radiation. They take a bit of a hit because it's pretty tough treatment. They get better before they come for surgery. They have surgery, they drop down again. And then here they are three months later, one year later, and we know if we follow them out, it continues to go up. So we're trying to cure them, but we're also offering them better quality of life. And this is just the same thing, just showing the improvement in swallowing and eating. So we have two ongoing studies in quality of life right now. We're comparing two different quality of life instruments in patients. We're also doing something that's quite different, which is a, what's called a qualitative study. And this involves patients or patients' families or caregivers coming to small groups, what we call focus groups of three to four people, and allowing them to talk about their experience from the patient's perspective, they can talk about their experience as the patient, but also in a separate focus group, the family members or caregivers can talk about their experience. Uh, because these, these instruments only give us so much information. And, and through actually hearing what patients and families have to say, we hope to get more information, more quality information that will help us to provide kind of more holistic care to the patient and their family. Oh, I meant to mention there is a bulletin board back there with uh, Kathy Zeman's business card. If you're interested or you know someone who might be interested in participating in our focus groups, uh, please call her. So in terms of improving outcomes from surgery, we want to reduce complications. We want to reduce cancer mortalities. We want to improve cancer-specific outcomes. We've gotten very aggressive about the surgery. We're, we want to remove every last bit of tumor and leave only healthy tissue behind. So we've 
uh, we've adopted a, a sort of more radical surgical approach, what we call on-block resections or modified on-block resections, and that is panning out in reducing local recurrences from cancer. In terms of other outcomes we want to improve, we found out from our database that pneumonia was a big problem after esophageal surgery. And so we've modified our perioperative protocols to prevent pneumonia. And I'm happy to say that we've been able to do that. We also found out that when we take the esophagus out and we can reconstruct it, we pull the stomach up uh, to join with the esophagus. And that join can be a problem and it can leak. And that was a big source of trouble for patients. So we modified our approach. We know, found we realized that if we made the joint down in the chest instead of up in the neck, that it leaked less often, way less often. And so as a group, we kind of said, okay, we're gonna do interthoracic anastomoses unless we absolutely have to go up to the neck. And that has made a huge difference. Simple things that make a difference. What about minimally invasive surgery? So we've embarked on minimally invasive esophagectomy. Um, I I'm kind of a believer in it. And this is a picture of our minimally invasive operating room. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. It's full of flat screen, high definition, flat screens, and they're all high definition. The cameras are high definition. And the thing is, if you can see it, you can do it. It's made a huge difference. So instead of having big incisions in the tummy, in the chest, five little incisions on the tummy, five little incisions on the chest, people are up walking around the next day. I think it's going to make a difference. It, it's made a difference already in terms of recovery. Um, and I think it's, we're, going to, we're still able to do a good cancer operation. Josh made me put this slide in. Where's Josh? Okay. That's us operating. So I want to tell you a little bit more about our, my, our research program, our translational research program. Michael Coe is a surgeon now at St. Joseph's Hospital, but he was a resident with us. And he did the initial work on microRNA comparing microRNA in patients before and after chemoradiation. So remember, microRNA is a little piece of genetic material, and microRNAs actually control a lot of genes. So one microRNA can control a lot of genes. And he identified several microRNA that were significantly different in patients who had complete responses to their chemoradiation compared to those who didn't. And two of those microRNA that were identified have been identified in other tumors as being tumor suppressors, so it seems to make some sense to us. So that was some preliminary work that he's done, and that work has now been published. And Matthew Dur Dr. Matthew Duroué, who's a PhD we recruited last fall, is gonna continue on with Dr. Coe's work and, and further test this, these microRNA findings and validate some of the work that Mike did. He's also developing some esophageal cancer cell lines so that you can kind of test treatments on cells in a dish uh, before you take it to patients. He's trying also to identify what cellular pathways are controlled by those microRNA that, that Mike co-identified and then explore their role in the tumor's sensitivity or resistance to therapy. And the whole goal of this is, again, is to aim to, we aim to personalize therapy for patients. You know, what is a good drug for this person may not be a good drug for that person. So, okay, can we identify the drug that's going to work for that tumor in that patient? Some of our other people that work with us, Dr. ming Yao Lu and Dr. Dr. Atsushi Shiozaki, uh, identified a new gene that is uh, increased in uh, squamous cell cancers of the esophagus. They call it XB130. And we're about to embark on evaluating that gene in adenocarcinoma. In Japan, squamous cell cancer is the most common cancer, esophageal cancer, um, and we want to know if that gene is also uh, increased in our patient population. I already mentioned that Matthew is developing these esophageal cancer cell lines, and one of our pathologists, Dr. Hala El Zamidi, is working with us to develop something called tissue microarrays. So tissue microarrays are kind of a tool. You kind of have a, a block, and you put samples of many different tumors on that block and you also put samples of normal tissue, and then you can check for ch gene changes in genes in many tumors all at once. So instead of going out and doing this slide from this patient and that slide from that patient, we can test them all right here. And I think that block is just about finished. We also collaborate with Dr. Jeffrey Liu, who's based at uh, Princess Margaret, and he's a very busy guy. I apologize if he shows up and sees this slide because I changed it a little bit. It was very busy, just like he is. 
And he's been doing, uh, keeping an epidemiologic database looking at risk factors for development of cancer and also risk factors that may affect response to treatment. He's looking at genetic and environmental risk factors. Um, and he's also looking at other genetic changes that might predict response uh, or sensitivity to treatment. Um, he's also growing some human tumors on mice, what we call xenografts. So we take some samples from tumors and we implant them in the mice and they're growing in the mice. And then we can test cancer treatments on the mice. So Matthew's doing the cell lines so we can test the cancer treatments just on some individual cells. And then we can go and test them in mice and then eventually we'll get to us. But we wanna test them on the mice first. We're all, he's also uh, helped us with our international collaborations with the, the NIH Cancer Genome uh, Atlas, as well as something called Barrett's Esophagus and Adenocarcinoma Consortium, or BEACON, and we're contributing blood samples to that. So we're kind of busy. So I want to tell you a little bit about Barrett's Esophagus. So Barrett's Esophagus is a condition that develops in the esophagus in response to prolonged uh, acid reflux. So it's a response to injury. So this slide sort of illustrates what happens. Over here is sort of the normal esophagus lining, um, which is the cells are flat. And then with all this constant irritation, they, they change and they become these sort of tall cells we call goblet cells. And if the injury continues over time, those goblet cells are kind of irritated and they get kind of angry and they start developing changes what we call dysplasia. And you can have low-grade dysplasia, and that can progress, here, we're seeing sort of here, and then it gets more angry looking, what we call high-grade dysplasia, and eventually it becomes an invasive cancer. An invasive cancer that grows through that little layer and then gets into those lymph nodes. And this is a slide showing such a patient. This is a 75-year-old gentleman, a long history of heartburn, and on the left-hand panel, we can see a pic picture of his esophagus. This pale pink is the normal lining, and down here is sort of the more red lining. That's the Barrett's. That's the columnar epithelium. And in the distance is his cancer, which we can see a little closer. So he has a CAT scan, so that's part of our standard protocol for evaluating somebody with cancer. And this is... Uh, the heart up here, this is the aorta back here, this is the esophagus, and the white is the contrast dye that the patient drinks, and here's this sort of thick part of the esophagus. It doesn't look too bad. Uh, and this is his endoscopic ultrasound, and I want to acknowledge the generous contribution of Michael and David Goldstein and their families that allowed us to have an endoscopic ultrasound. So this is your endoscopic ultrasound, thank you very much. This is a picture of this tumor. The black circle in the center is actually the ultrasound device. Then we inflate a balloon. This is the balloon. And then this is the esophagus wall over here. And this is normal esophagus wall. And this is the tumor. So it's a contained tumor, tumor but even so, this is a T3 tumor. So it's already invaded into the muscle layers of the esophagus. Well, we know that 20% of people have daily heartburn. So that's a lot of us in this room. Probably there's some of you who have daily heartburn. And about 10% of people who have gastroesophageal reflux disease will have Barrett's esophagus. So that's about 1.5% of the general adult population. We know that Barrett's esophagus is a risk factor for esophagus adenocarcinoma. Now, I don't want you to think just because you have heartburn that you have Barrett's, and just because you have Barrett's, you have cancer, or that you're going to have cancer because not everybody with Barrett's esophagus goes on and develops cancer. But we know that in people who have Barrett's, they are at more risk than someone who doesn't have Barrett's. So until recently, the only option we had for keeping an eye on those people was what we call surveillance endoscopy. So we'd bring them back for a scope, we'd do biopsies, we'd look for any changes that might suggest that that Barrett's is gonna get worse. So is it normal Barrett's or is it, do they have dysplasia? And that's all we could offer those people. The problem is we have not been able to figure out which patient with Barrett's is going to progress to high-grade dysplasia or go on to get cancer. We're pretty sure that whenever somebody gets high-grade dysplasia, they will get a cancer if we don't do something about it. 
We know that our biopsy technique, even if we do lots of biopsies, we sometimes miss, miss the cancer. We don't even notice the cancer. It might just look like the regular part kind of Barrett's. So there's what we call sampling error. And even if we get the right samples, the pathologists don't even agree. So 30% of the time, the pathologists will look at the same slide and they'll call it low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia. Or maybe they won't even call it dysplasia at all. So this is a problem. So surveillance is all we've had, but it's not really a great solution. It doesn't prevent the cancer, it doesn't cure the cancer, and it's certainly not cost effective. So this is um, just so a little more information about Barrett's. This is um, NDBE stands for non-dysplastic Barrett's. And we know that over a one year period, about 4% of people who have non-dysplastic Barrett's or kind of normal Barrett's will show changes we call low-grade dysplasia. 0.9% will get changes that we would call hydrate-grade dysplasia, and we consider those people at very high risk for cancer. And even some of them might develop cancer over that one-year period. So you can have a scope this year that says no, nothing to worry about Barrett's, no dysplasia, and within the year have cancer. Now that's a very small number of patients. This slide says 0.5%. It's probably less than that. But just to put it in perspective, 0.5% risk of cancer in a year is the same as colon polyps. And we all have gone for a colonoscopy to get our colon polyps out. So it's, it's not something we should ignore. And of course, if you have high grade, low grade dysplasia or high grade dysplasia, your risk of developing cancer within the next year, within the next five years, is even higher. So up until recently, all we had was scopes, scopes, and more scopes. And then in 2009, uh, a large collaborative group published this paper in the New England Journal called Radiofrequency Ablation in Barrett's Esophagus. This was a randomized clinical trial. So I come back to clinical trials again. A randomized clinical trial or phase three trial is you take a bunch of patients who have the same problem and the computer says, okay, you're gonna get this treatment and the, this other group's gonna get that treatment. And the doctor, the patient has no control over which group they go into. And we, we can do that when we don't know which tra treatment is really better. Is this really a better treatment? We had no idea. So they did a randomized controlled trial of radiofrequency ablation for patients with Barrett's versus just surveillance endoscopy. And just to kind of simplify this slide a little bit, we'll just look on the, this left panel. I'm having trouble with the mouse. The left-hand slide, part of the slide shows uh, what we call any progression. So the light gray bar is the patients who just had the scope. The black bar is the patient who had radiofrequency abl ablation. And in this follow-up period, 16% of the people who had the scope progressed. Their, their Barrett's changed. They got dysplasia. If they had dysplasia, they got high-grade dysplasia, something like that. It got worse. But only 3% of the patients who had the, Barrett, the radiofrequency ablation had any progression. So it seems to interrupt that progression. And if we look a little further over the third panel, we can see patients who had high-grade dysplasia. So these are the patients we think are most at risk. So the patients who just had surveillance endoscopy, 19% of them progressed to cancer within the follow-up period. But of the patients who had radiofrequency ablation, only 2.5% of those patients progressed. So it seems that this offers them um, an alternative to just waiting for the cancer to develop. And in many patients, we were able to completely get rid of the Barrett's. So the black bars, again, are the parent patients who had radiofrequency ablation. And in most patients, we were able to get rid of that Barrett's. It's gone. So here's an example. This shows you the endoscopic picture, again, that, similar to what I showed you before. So how do we do this, Barrett? So you come, you have an endoscopy. We put this uh, special catheter device in your esophagus, and it has this electrode on it. We inflate the balloon, and that brings the electrode into contact with your esophagus, with the Barrett's lining, and then we turn on the generator, and it kills the cancer cells, or kills the Barrett cells, pardon me, the Barrett cells. And this is what it looks like afterwards. So you see this white lining. That's all the killed cells from our treatment. So we started a Barrett's program last fall. And this is, uh, we were able to do this because this has been funded by donors like, like some of you. 
uh, like all of you, hopefully, um, who've donated money to allow us to, to start this program. We've treated three patients uh, so far with two ablations each, and they've all had more than 50% reduction in the length of their Barrett's. And our goal is to expand this program to prevent high-risk patients from developing cancer and to make this available uh, and, and the standard of care for all such patients. And I'll show you our first patient who's sitting right here at the front of the room, Mr. Provis. Mr. Provis, and you can read about him in your report there. Mr. Provis volunteered to be part of this program. He knew that we were just starting, um, but he had high-grade dysplasia, and he didn't want to get cancer because his brother had esophagus cancer. And so far, we're in good shape. Thank you, Mr. Provis. So we know that patients who have prolonged heartburn can get uh, Barrett's esophagus. Pe some people with Barrett's esophagus can get cancers. Um, so if we can identify who is at risk of developing cancer once they have Barrett's, can we then go back to well, a lot of us in this room who have heartburn? And can we identify who in this room who has heartburn might be at risk of developing cancer? And here we're kind of we're reaching a little. We're not there yet. For, by sh for sure. It's impossible to do surveillance endoscopy on all of us. So what we'd like to be able to do is identify who is at risk of developing cancer. Who who has reflux is at, at risk. Um, we actually have a, a, a collection of samples from about 360 patients who have bad reflux. Uh, we've got blood samples, we have buccal smears, and we're just starting to analyze those to samples to see if we can identify genetic changes that might predict which of those patients is going to go on and develop a cancer. Um, so next update, hopefully I'll have that information for you. But we have already collected those samples and that analysis is starting. So in terms of education awareness, I want you, esophageal cancer is relatively rare. You know, we don't have a ribbon for it. Uh, we don't have a walk for it. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, symptoms are often overlooked by patients certainly by doctors. I, I have a lot of patients who said, you know, I, I asked my doctor about this, but he didn't think anything of it. He or she didn't think anything of it. So we're having an educational event for family doctors in this fall uh, just to make them more aware of what the symptoms are and that even the little trivial incident at the restaurant might be important. I'd also like to acknowledge the International Union of Operating Engineers. They have organized a uh, memorial golf tournament for Gary O'Neill. Gary O'Neill died of esophageal cancer and he was the president of their union. And that tournament's coming up on June the 29th and they've kindly, um, they've kindly agreed to donate the proceeds from that golf tournament to our esophageal program. Unfortunately, uh, they were not able to be here today but I just want to acknowledge Michael Gallagher and his colleagues for this. We also are going to build on something we learned from our lung cancer group, and we are, have established a phone line or, and a fax line for referrals for esophageal diseases. And although this has been, is, we're targeting esophageal cancer patients, we, it's not restricted to esophageal cancer, so any esophageal program, uh, any esophageal problem, uh, problem could be referred this way. And that is going to go live next month. We, it's based on our, what we call our Lung Ramp program, which is lung, stands for Lung Rapid Access Management Program. So, you know, it's hard for family doctors. They have a patient with a problem and they don't know who to call. You're going to call our esophagus ramp program. And we've established our multidisciplinary clinics and we're working on our developing our tumor board so that we can get together and talk about difficult patient problems. Those patients that I showed you earlier that you know, we're turned down elsewhere. Should we take them on? Can we offer them something? We don't want to offer them false hope, but can we offer them a treatment when no one else has been willing to do so? So our future directions are kind of to identify patients who have reflux, who are at risk for esophagus cancer. We want to be able to modify their risk, reduce their risk of, of ca developing cancer. We want to reduce the risk of cancer in Barrett's by using radiofrequency ablation. We want to expand that program. We would like to be able to identify a genetic sig signature that predicts response to treatment, and we're working on that now. Matthew's working on that. Jeff Liu's working on that. We want to prevent the 
prevents the development. We want to get rid of that curve uh, and bring it down to where everybody else is, down here at the bottom, nice and flat. And most importantly, we want to provide a personalized cancer care for each and every patient. I want to thank my collaborators. Just some of them are listed here, Dr. Jennifer Knox and Rebecca Wong, who started our first clinical trial. Ann Horgan, who's one of our clinical fellows who looked after our patients. Jeffrey Liu, Michael Ko, our resident. Ming Yao, Atsushi Shiozaki, Matthew Duroe, who's working in the lab for us now. Catherine Zieman, uh, and Jennifer Listu, who are our, our um, clinical research associates who run our clinical research program. And Joanne Sulman, who keeps pushing me to keep going forward. Um, Joanne Sulman is the mover and shaker behind Quality Life Projects and uh, keeps whipping me to keep going. And I'd also like to thank my partners and colleagues in thoracic surgery. And I especially want to thank all of you for coming here this afternoon to listen to me talk. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Oh, yes. So the question is, is there any improvement on omeprazole? So omeprazole is a drug proton pump inhibitor that is designed to stop acid production in the stomach uh, so that you don't injure your esophagus. And there are a number of other drugs. They're all supposed to work the same way. Um, I think some of them last a little longer than omeprazole. Uh, but I think if omeprazole works, that's all you need. If you, it's not working, you can take more of it. You can switch drugs. But there, there are other drugs, but they're all in the same family. Yes? <laughs> right. Oh, I see. And you've had... Uh, so the question is, so if someone who has Barrett's, how, how can they get in touch with us? And, and uh, my question to you is, you've had a scope and... Right. Yeah. There is, there is a gray area, we, as we've mentioned. Uh, they often don't agree, and, and our response to that is usually to do more scopes more often. Um, so one of the questions that's come up is, should we be offering radiofrequency ablation to patients who don't have high, who have Barrett's but don't have high-grade dysplasia? So the original work um, so it would suggest that there is a benefit, um, and, and certainly I think the American Gastroenterology Association is coming out in favor of offering radiofrequency ablation to patients who look like they might be in a higher risk category, even if they don't actually have high-grade dysplasia. So radiofrequency ablation was first started for patients who, who could not have an operation. They were too not fit enough for an operation. And then we realized it worked, and so now we're kind of expanding. Um, and so we'd certainly be happy to talk to you about having a look if you want. I guess you can get in touch with me. Yes, sir. Sorry, I saw one article which was very interesting to me that in the Mayo Clinic, the one that's in Florida, mm -hmm. um, and the article was called Shaving Off Cancer, and they developed a technique um, without normal operations and cutting to go inside the esophagus and very carefully shave off the top level, and they've got to the point where it was an out, outpatient. Now, maybe I'm, my facts are wrong or whatever. No, you're right. That's actually, so the question is about shaving off cancer without an operation. So the patient has an endoscopic procedure, and they go in, and they literally shave the cancer off the lining of the esophagus. So I think that that is, um, is a very valuable treatment for very early cancer. And I'll, I'll sort of mention my slide, that, that, that slide of the lymph nodes I showed you in the beginning. Because once that cancer has gone through that, that very first layer, then shaving it off may not be good enough. So the big trick is to figure out, is it above that layer or is it below that layer? And so we do something called endomucosal resection, 
uh, and then there's this other term that they use for this, the bigger procedure. But endomucosal resection is kind of the first step. So we do a scope, and instead of just taking a little piece, a little biopsy, we try to shave off the inner lining layer above what we call the basement membrane. And then the pathologist looks at it, and they see, are those bad cells just at the very top, or are they penetrating deeper? And if they're penetrating to the bottom of where we've shaved it off, we're not sure that that shave is good enough. Now, if it turns out you're a person whose health is not very good, and you're not a candidate for an operation, maybe that's all you do. Or maybe you have that, and then you have radiation. Um, but, but the gastroenterologists are very keen on doing these procedures, and in the U.S., of, of course, it's a, it's a big thing. And the surgeons are a little nervous because they think, well, what about if it's going through? And what about the lymph nodes? And you're not going to get the lymph nodes. So I think it's a very good option in the right patient. And we're, we're, we're doing that also. Not like as many as they are, though. Can I go to the back first and then come forward? Thank you, Doctor. On, on slide number six, there is a chart. Uh, I wonder if you uh, could interpret that for us. Uh, either esophagus cancer is, 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 has been on a 45 degree angle and totally uh, uh, wild in terms of the numbers, and the others have leveled out and uh, you've been working for longer periods. Esophagus is virtually off the chart. Yes. Uh, but if you traded stocks, you would take some relief because uh, it appears now to uh, be coming down to what could be a, a head and shoulders uh, formation. Uh, I just, but could you interpret that chart for me? What, what, what does that tell me, that chart? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I quite caught the end of your question, where it's coming down at the end. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, back in 75, that's as far back as your stats went. Are we talking numbers here, like we've got thousands of, 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 of patients with this stuff, uh, with uh, esophagus cancer, uh, but not yet treated, and, and they die off quickly or over a long period of time. But those patients with other types of cancer, uh, you've been at it long enough. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. These are, this is what we call incidents, so these are new cases, new cancer cases, and this chart is, um, looking at the frequency or the incidence of new cancers relative to what the rate was in 1975. So, get my mouse there. So this is where kind of we started. And in 1975, adenocarcinoma in the esophagus was virtually unheard of because the esophagus is lined with squamous mucosa, not what we call columnar mucosa. And adenocarcinoma comes from columnar mucosa. So most cancers in that time were squamous mucosas. And all of a sudden, we started seeing these adenocarcinomas. And, and you know, we haven't clearly explained why we're seeing so many. But this is a relative increase compared to 1975, whereas the, the, the new cases of breast cancer, lung cancer, are relatively constant. And if we, look, if we drill down on those, we actually see those are coming down. Now, whether the little drop at the end is real or not, we don't know yet. It's early days. So... Yes. I'd like to ask, to what extent do the, do the hospitals of the University Hospital Network know about your, your uh, study? And to what extent would patients with, with this difficulty be able to be treated at these other hospitals? Other hospitals other than our hospital? Yeah, other hospitals of the University Hospital Network. Oh, okay. The people, so people who have uh, this kind of cancer, esophagus cancer, would generally be referred to uh, like a gastroenterologist, a GI specialist at our hospital, a surgeon, and, and our hospital is different than some places that the esophagus cancer surgery is done by the thoracic surgeons. It's like that in Canada and the U.S. In Europe, it's done by what we call GI surgeons. Um, and so those patients would tend to be referred into us. Um, sometimes they get referred directly to the medical or radiation oncologists. Um, but because we have this multidisciplinary collaboration, 
they'll say, you know, uh, I've got this patient coming into clinic tomorrow, can you see them too? And so we often, even though that patient was originally scheduled to see me or one of my colleagues, because we're there, they'll say, could you look at these x-rays? Do you think this patient could have surgery? Or, you know, what do you think is going to be the best treatment? Or they'll be referred to me for surgery, and I'll say, you know, probably not surgery alone. Probably we need some extra help. And we just walk down the hall and say, have a look at this x-ray. Can you see this patient? And ideally, when it works really well, they see the patient right then. The patient doesn't have to come back. It doesn't always work quite that well, but... Okay. disease? Oh, that's a tough question. I'm not sure I can answer it. The question is, uh, can I comment on the relationship between, between drugs that are uh, prescribed to prevent osteoporosis and acid reflux disease? And to be perfectly honest, I don't know exactly the answer. I do know that uh, some of those drugs are irritating to the esophagus and that some people have to stop taking them because of the irritation to their esophagus. Um, that's as much as I know. Yes, sir. That's a potential problem. And we didn't, we didn't sort of think of that before, right? And now we're starting to see the side effects of these other drugs. Um, the question related to the effect of proton pump inhibitors on bones and, and osteoporosis, and does it contribute to osteoporosis? Um, and so certainly we know that some of those drugs do have an effect on the bones. Um, and so if you're someone who's at risk for that or have been found to have osteoporosis, uh, you have to look carefully at which drug you're on. Oh, yes. With reference to thank you, with reference to the RF um, ablation, yes. How do you protect the healthy cells from damage? So the, the the radiofrequency ablation kind of only burns to a certain depth. There was a previous treatment called photodynamic therapy, which was supposed to do the same sort of thing, but the the depth of injury was um, was deeper and harder to predict, uh, and the radiofrequency ablation seems to just go to the mucosal layer. Um, so they've, I'm not an engineer, but they've tested that over time. So that it just affects the inner, the, the inner lining or mucosal layer. It doesn't go into the muscle layers, so we have less strictures and that sort of thing. Uh, and when the, when the, so it effectively burns the lining. And when the, the lining heals, it heals with the normal squamous lining. Um, the other part of that, though, is we have to protect that lining from acid. So the patient would be on a proton pump inhibitor, or in the case of some patients, they've had anti-reflux surgery ahead of time. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity then to invite everyone to join me in thanking Dr. Darling for um, an astounding presentation. I think you provided us with a very, very in-depth look at the work that you're doing here at UHN and the various forms of esophageal cancer that you're looking into. and um, I. I I can see that there is a lot around the corner that's going to change the face of how this disease is treated and prevented. So thank you very much. Um, this concludes another behind the scenes lecture. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank everyone for coming out today and thank you for your very interesting questions. If you're interested in learning more about this program, um, I have two colleagues here in the audience with me. I'm just going to quickly introduce them. Um, Josh Lai, 
Uh, and Dolores Larrier, where's Dolores? Dolores is at the back behind you. Um, Dolores oversees the surgical innovation and respirology programs for our foundation, and Josh oversees the thoracic surgery program. So if you have any questions relating to what are the priorities that we're currently fundraising for, and if, if there's a way that you think you might be able to help, um, please speak to Josh or Dolores or to myself after this um, presentation. Um, you're, you're welcome to stay and enjoy the refreshments, but it looks like our days turned into quite a lovely afternoon, so um, I'm sure you're all anxious to get out and enjoy the day. So thank you once again for coming. Thank you to Dr. Darling. Thank you to Paul Farrell. And um, have, a, have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>